Hi, this is Reach Out with the Lynns, and I'm Jerry. And I'm Kelly. And we're going to be talking today about don't worry. The Lord does not want us to worry. And uh, we're going to be looking at a few scriptures that uh, tell us about the fact that the Lord's going to take care of things if we just trust in Him. So perhaps you're worrying about a few things, and we're going to take care of those worries before we finish the program. So I'm going to ask for my lovely wife, Kelly, to lead us in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just praise your name. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity to look at these scriptures and to learn about one of the things that many of us find ourselves doing, worrying. Father, we ask now that you would show us in your word what we're to do when we begin to feel like we are worrying. We ask you to bless us, open the scriptures, and send the Holy Spirit to really teach us and change us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We had another message prepared, and we were all set to come into the pulpit and give it, and the Lord began to speak to me and to Kelly independently. No, I don't want that yet. I want don't worry. So we're going to be looking at uh, several scriptures, beginning in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 25. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which is today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble." The Lord knows that we're prone to worry, and the preceding verse, I, I think, gives us a little bit of an insight into why he addressed this topic, because we can say don't worry, but deep down inside there's something that's making us worry. We need to address that, and so the preceding verse, verse 24, I think is also important. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And the word for mammon is riches. Mammon was a Philistine god of wealth. And uh, we can say, don't worry, but then the question comes up, but I've got these bills. I've got such pressure on me financially. And that's why the Lord, I think, talks about worry right after he talks about the fact, you've got to make a choice. Are you going to serve God or are you going to serve riches? And I think that's a struggle that we really have to deal with. And frankly, it becomes a lifelong struggle. Uh, that's why I think it's important for us to get our priorities right and make sure the Lord is first. The last verse he talks about in, um, or in verse 33, rather. Read that again, honey, would you please? But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. It's a question of priorities, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Putting the Lord first. Is the Lord first in my prayers, in my praise, 
in my decision making, in my giving? Am I giving him the first of my fruits, the first tenth, the tithe? That's a struggle, isn't it? Because we work hard for that money. And uh, the Bible tells us, Old Testament and New Testament, to bring the tithe into the storehouse. Well, as we do, we're putting God first. And that's one of the ways to really cripple the devil's hold on us, is to take that 10% and give it to the Lord and say, now, Lord, fulfill your promise. And, uh, oh, he has promises there as we bring Amen. that tithe Amen. into the storehouse. In fact, he closes in the... Uh, Old Testament with a wonderful series of promises about bringing that tithe, verse 10 and following. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Okay, and then he's going to go on and tell us what he's going to do and I, with and the I, devourer. And I love this. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. So this becomes a, a question of a struggle for us. When I got saved... Uh, Oh, about 40 years ago, I went to a little church uh, on a Sunday night for the first time, and I had two men, not just independently, come up and say to me, hi, I'm so-and-so, do you tithe? And I said, I don't even know what tithing is. And uh, he said, give God the first 10%, as he says in his word. And when you do that, he'll rebuke the devourer. If you don't give that tithe, then the devil's going to get it, and he'll give it to the car dealer and the dentist and the doctor and what have you. And, uh, well, I, I did tithe, and I've encouraged many folks over the years to do it, and I've never been discouraged. You've had your own testimonies about tithing, honey? I have. Um, I remember at one time I had learned uh, to tithe. I made a very small amount of money, and I started, remember, I called my girlfriend, Diane, and I was complaining about all of my problems and bills, and she said, get all your bills together. <laughs> so we lived in a kind of a big house at the time, and, um, it, but it had needed a lot of work, and it was a lot of kids. And so she came over to the house, and she came in my room, and I had a pile this big. And, you know, some of them were envelopes and things. And so she laid her hands on them, and she prayed, we prayed over them. And she said, now you have to give 10%. I said, well, I can't give 10% because um, I wasn't in charge of any of the, the bills. She said, what m part of the money do you have? So I had a certain amount of money that I was bringing in. She said, tithe your money. And so I began to tithe my money. Um, and I would say probably in a few years, I was completely out of debt. And I bought another house. Um, and it was just amazing. But then I went back into debt when I became a nurse and I, because I stopped tithing. So I stand by tithing now, 100%. And I was thinking about something today. Um, I've been on, you know, I've been eating a lot of whole foods. And I've been uh, really, my diet has really changed. And I'm, I'm really hearing about from the Lord uh, for some health issues uh, through prayer, praise, and uh, and uh, nutrition. And so I was, I was thinking about things, and the Lord really just put on my heart, we would not need so much medicine. We would not meet, need medicine so much if we just did what was right in the beginning. If we ate whole foods, if we ate natural, we didn't eat out of a box, we didn't live to eat, but we, you know, we, we ate just to live. Um, so we, we, we eat, but we don't need to have an abundance of food. We just need what's healthy for us to keep us going. And so as the Lord is really working with that, I was thinking about that concept and how true that is. The same thing, if we would just do what was right, and so many times people come and we pray for them, and we don't, you know, part of us don't want to say, are you tithing? Because we don't want them to think, we want you to give money to us. If that's not really all what it is, what we want you to do is we want you to get out of debt because we know it works. That's right. And so if you, it's the same thing with the body or the 
you have to put the right things into the body, and then the body will work right. You won't need to put everything else into it to fix it. And so it's the same thing with the kingdom of God. If we put the right things into the kingdom of God, and we do what's right in the beginning, we won't have all these problems. You're not going to, you're going to be blessed in the field, out of the field, financially, medically. But it's, it's a long process, and you have to learn what the Word says. That's right. That's right. So does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely, totally. And uh, Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians regarding our giving. Uh, it actually goes even beyond the tithe. And incidentally, before we leave the message of the tithe, um, the, uh, some folks say, well, it's not in the New Testament. Well, yeah, it really is. Uh, Jesus once said uh, regarding the Pharisees and their conduct, he said, you're tithing, and that's good, don't don't neglect the tithing, but add to it mercy and love and justice. And in Hebrews chapter right. 7, in That's talking right. about Melchizedek, who really is Jesus, way in the Old Testament back in Genesis, uh, it talks about the fact that he, that's Jesus, really is receiving our tithes. Verse 8 here, honey, if you'll read that. Here mortal men receive tithes, but there he receives them, of whom it is witness that he lives. Uh, so who's the one receiving the tithe? You go to your local church, you bring your tithe in there, they pass the plate, they have a, a system for processing those payments. They're not the ones who are ultimately receiving it. Uh, here, mortal men receive it, that's true, but there, in heaven, it is really being given to the Lord. Again, here, mortal men receive the tithes, so they take your collection, uh, and you should tithe in your local storehouse where you're being fed. And uh, there, that means in heaven, mm -hmm. he, referring to Jesus, receives them, of whom it is witnessed, he still lives. So the Lord is the one who's tithing, and I say this lovingly, when we don't tithe, he's the one who's not getting the tithe. And he has given his life for us, we can certainly give 10%. And isn't that a beautiful scripture, though, to say that that the Lord receives that. That's right. If we really understood the concept of how it is the Lord who receives those. That's right. And, you know, it's up to, you may say, well, I don't want to give it to my pastor. I don't want to give it to my church. Well, you know, if he, if you, you've got to look at where it really goes and how it's seen in the kingdom of God. And that is so precious. Here, mortal men receive tithes, but there he receives them of whom it is witness that he lives. And sometimes we hear the objection, I don't know if my pastor or the church is handling that money properly. Right, right. We hear that argument. Uh, well, first of all, you ought to pray about whether that's the church you ought to be in. That's if, right. you don't, if you don't trust your leadership for giving, I'm not sure that's the place you ought to be. But in any event, that's not your problem because your responsibility is to give through them to the Lord. And if they abuse it, you have still given it to the Lord. Yes. You've been obedient. You've He's done it. It doesn't you. matter. Jesus is going to take That's care right. of you. Yeah, and yeah. tell and them. he'll take care of them, too. If they I have was, done wrong, yes. he'll straighten them out. But you're off the hook. Absolutely. You've been obedient. But if you withhold it because you don't like how they're handling it, then you're not being blessed. It's sowing and reaping. And we're going to talk about that next. Can we go to rebuke and the devourer again? Sure. I really want to say that one more time. And this, to me, is the scary part. And I want that devourer rebuked in my life. Absolutely here. Verse and 11. so it says, again, can I read a 10 sure. down? Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. He, so he says, try me. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, so that he will not destroy the fruit of the ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, said the Lord of hosts. hosts. So he's going to rebuke the devourer for your sake, and uh, the, the fruit of the ground will not be destroyed, uh, nor shall the vine fail to bear, bear fruit for you. I want all those blessings. I want the re devourer rebuked. I don't know about you, but I've had enough of him. That's right. That's right. And this, I really uh, have. And uh, people say, well, if you, if you bring the tithe in, will he bless you in non-financial ways or financial ways? 
Uh, and the answer is both, because when you sow, you're going to reap what you sowed. It's going to be in kind, but there are other residual benefits. Uh, we mentioned again what those people said to me 40 years ago. Uh, you're going to pay that tithe either to the Lord or to the car repair or the And that goes back to that the right dentist, there. Yep. And I will rebuke the devourer That's for right. your sakes that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground. How about relationships with your family? You know, when, when you're not uh, in, in obedience, all sorts of things go wrong. And we need to have peace. When, when you have a child who won't talk to you, uh, grandkids that uh, won't talk to you, that breaks your heart. That's more important to you than money being withheld. So you and want to do whatever's right. Do, uh, follow the Lord so you have those blessings. That's right. And so uh, he says the people around you are going to be observing what's going on. Verse 12. All the nations will call you blessed. For you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Yeah. People are not going to say, poor Jerry. He tithed. He starved to death. He died early. No, they're not going to say that. They're going to say about you and me that they're being obedient and they're being blessed. And uh, now in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul even goes beyond that because tithing is a good place to begin. It is not the end, really, because the Lord did say, bring the tithes and the offerings in. There are basically three kinds of giving in the scriptures. Um, and one, of course, is the tithe, the 10% that mm -hmm. goes to the Lord. Mm -hmm. Then there's offerings over and above. Mm -hmm. Thanks to God for what you've done. And then there's alms, giving to the poor, mm -hmm. as the Lord has need uh, for you to distribute that. But uh, actually, Paul goes beyond that standard of tithing in the New Testament to uh, cheerful giving. Uh, the word hilarious in the Greek it really means hilarious. And uh, let's read about the, the standard of giving, verse 6. But this I say, he who reaps, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. That's right. Go on, let's go on. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good works. As it is written, he is dispersed abroad, he is given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now, now let's stop there for a moment. We're talking about sowing and reaping. Uh, the snow is finally leaving the Albany area. We've had a late winter. And uh, I was noticing just coming up uh, on the road in front of the church today, an area where some grubs got into the grass uh, late last year. And I'm going to have to pull up that sod and get some soil and a little bit of starter and some seed. Now, how should I plant that seed in those areas where the grubs have destroyed the grass? Should I be very sparing and say to the uh, fellow at Home Depot, I just like to have a small little bag and I'm going to put one seed here and one seed over there and one here because I don't want to spend a lot of money, but I do want a rich, thick carpet of grass. Is that going to work? A five-year-old is going to say, Jerry, you're going to have to put a lot of seed in there because not all the seed is going to come up and you want to have a nice thick carpet. You can't just be so miserly. Same with giving. That's what he's talking about here. You sow bountifully, you're going to reap bountifully. Now you give as you purpose in your heart. Don't uh, get into a church service where the organ is swelling. I've been in those where they say, God says the, for those who give a thousand dollars, they're going to have so right. and so. No, uh, you give as your purpose in your heart. I, I, I wouldn't give on a motion. I'd be praying about it ahead of time. Make sure you're being led of the Lord. Purpose in your heart and then do it with a cheerful attitude. Um, and here's God's standard. His God's standard is not just to keep you alive. Not just to have enough clothing to keep you warm and enough food so you don't starve. Frankly, it's not all about you. It's not all about me. It's about us being used by God for others. Let's look at verse 8 again, honey. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. Ah, your needs met so that you can go out and meet the needs of others. Amen. The Lord wants to bless the world. He wants to get missions out there. He wants to get Bibles out there. He wants radio broadcasts, television, all kinds of expenses are necessary. He wants to use his church. He doesn't want to go to the world to do it. He doesn't want to go to the government to do it. He wants for believers to be part of the blessing. 
and part of the harvest. And so he wants to meet your needs and my needs, and then through us, we meet the needs of others. Amen. Uh, so here we find that, uh, here's a, pr a promise now from the Old Testament, Psalm 112. As it is written, he has dispersed abroad, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Um, so we, we give it out, and um, we give of our goods, the poor are fed, uh, the church has a chance to fulfill its ministry to orphans and uh, whatever other callings they have, and the righteousness endures forever. What does that mean? Around the throne of God, when the thrones are passed, when the crowns are passed out, the righteousness is remembered. Frankly, we give money today, tomorrow we're going to forget about it, or the day after. Certainly five years from now, you can't recall what you gave to what work, but God does. And in heaven, he's going to be playing that back on some kind of a video or what have you. On a certain date, you gave to this mission, and this was what happened to that money, and these people came to the Lord, and this is the fruit of their lives, and their families were led to Christ, and on and on it goes. Well, God's able to bless everybody. Look at verse 10. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Whoa. While you are enriched in everything for all liberal liberality, which causes thanksgiving through us to God. Okay, now, God's able to supply seed to the sower. I'm trusting that when I go to Home Depot or wherever I go to get that seed, that we're going to have the money here in the church to buy the seed. So God is the ultimate one who supplies mm -hmm. that seed. And uh, as we are uh, using money in the kingdom to sow into God's harvest, uh, then he's the one that supplies that. And bread for food, he's going to be able to bring forth the pastors and the evangelists and the teachers and, and the saints to go out and, and plant the seed in people's hearts. Uh, he'll supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. So you put in a dollar and that dollar goes to missions and that missionary goes over to Africa and works with orphans. Those orphans hear the word from that missionary. They take that uh, to others. Their lives are then going to be extended by hopefully 50, 60 years. How many folks are they going to touch for the Lord? You get the idea. Uh, and so it's just going to spread and spread and spread. So he goes on to say, you're the giver. What happens to you, verse 11? While you are enriched in everything for all liberality, which causes thanksgiving through us to God. So you're the giver, and you're enriched in everything because you are giving liberally, generously, and the people who are receiving give thanks to God. So you as the sower are being blessed. The recipient is being blessed. That person has money for food and shelter and what have you. And now consequently, God is being blessed through praise and through worship. Well, verse 12 goes on to say, For the administration of this service not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also is abounding through many thanksgivings to God. And there it is again. So your money is then being used for supplying the needs of the saints, people who have needs, uh, not only physical needs as such as food and clothing, but spiritual needs to hear the word of God. Uh, and it's abounding through many thanksgivings to God. So many folks are thanking God. Now you thank God. When you turn on the television, you turn on the radio, you go to church, you thank God Amen. that there were people who gave and gave sacrificially and liberally in order for the lights to be turned on and the heat to be turned on and the pastor to be uh, on staff and the staff to support him and those who uh, paid for that radio program that we listened to. We all benefit from that. Do we thank God for those people who gave? God does, and God's going to bless them for what they have done for his kingdom. And you know, we are the salt of the earth. Yep. And if the the uh, salt loses its flavor, what happens? That's right. It's good it's, for nothing. It's good for nothing. And so I, that just came to me because we are the salt. We're sprinkled through the earth, and we have to continue to do this. That's right. We must not hold back. And so it goes on to say in verse 13, while through the proof of this ministry, 
They glorify God for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ and for your liberal sharing with them and all men. So when you give, people are thanking you. We have orphans in India that we support, and we uh, get letters from the pastor in charge of that ministry over there. And he says, we're praying for you, and we're grateful to you for giving to this ministry. Amen. So uh, we need prayers, and we're not just our own family. We need people praying for us. When you're giving, people are praying for you and thanking God for you. And then go on, verse 14. And by their prayer for you, who long for you because of the exceeding grace of God in you, Thanks be to God for his incredible gift. Yes. And so by their prayers for you, they're thanking God because you have given, and uh, they're praying for you. Uh, they long for you. Uh, I've had people over in India and Africa say, we'd love to have you come and visit with us and share with us. Uh, they long to, to see us. Yes, uh, we're a blessing financially, but it's more than that. It's a spiritual connection. It's family. It's brothers and sisters in Christ coming together. And um, so we have thanksgiving to the sower because the sower has been faithful and the sower has been blessed. Mm -hmm. Thanksgiving to the recipients who receive it and pray for the sower. Thanks be to God because it's all because of him that it's happening. But all, it comes down to one final thanksgiving, verse 15. Thanks be to God for his incredible gift. His incredible or indescribable gift. And that gift is not money, not sowing of seed. That gift is Jesus Christ. Amen. So let's thank God for him. I don't feel like tithing, I don't feel like giving, I don't think I want to get involved with the work of the kingdom, but I want to be saved, I want to come to Christ, uh, I want for him to uh, wash me with his blood, and what happened to him? What about the gift of God? Did God have to give a tremendous gift to us in the life and the death uh, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Jesus talks about that wonderful gift in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So we talk about gifts, 10%, 20%. How about the life of Jesus Christ? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Amen. So with that in mind, let's leave on that wonderful note and receive the greatest gift of all, the Lord Jesus Christ. Kelly's going to lead us in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of your son, Jesus. We thank you for the wonderful uh, words we learned today from your holy word. We ask, Lord, that for all those who are listening, Lord, if anyone would like to be saved today, that they would repeat with uh, this prayer with me now. Dear Lord God, we ask you to forgive us for our sins. Come into our life. We repent and turn away from our sins, and we give our life to you. Please live your life to Jesus in me. I accept you as the Lord and Savior, the only Savior of the world, the Son of God. Please live your life in me and help me to live a life that is pleasing to you. I ask, Lord, that you bless every listener who has said this prayer, and may they truly be changed. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Don't worry. We will see you the next time. Blessings. God bless. He's passing by this moment, your needs to supply. Reach out.